for another um, lecture here at the Center for Global Security Research. I'm Mike Albertson. I am the deputy director here at CGSR at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, today, we're going to hear from Dr. Joseph Pilat, who is the program manager at Los Alamos National Laboratory for his talk titled The End of Arms Control. And if you are at all familiar with the world of, of arms control, you know this is a topic that comes up a great deal in arms, arms control workshops. Um, some people leave the question mark off the end of the end of arms control um, and just simply say arms control is, is at an end, period, end of story. Other people talk about the end of one particular era of arms control and the beginning of another. Um, that maybe arms control as we've we known it was sort of bilateral, multilateral, formal treaties um, that we that we did in the Cold War is 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 over, and we're on to sort of different models of of looser sort of risk reduction, confidence building measures. Others talk about how to revive the current architecture and and what comes next in formal arms control when, when New START expires. And if you tune in for this talk, you're probably you probably read the the synopsis that that Dr. Pilat prepared. Um, and notice that he he sort of addresses all of these these different sort of questions and modalities on on the topic in in his in his introduction. So it's an interesting question. Um, it's an interesting time to ask this question. Um, and luckily, we have an excellent speaker here to to help look at the topic. So I I will say a little bit about the speaker. Um, if I was in my office, I would have some of some of his books to to hold up and show everybody from my bookshelf. But I'm at home today. Um, Dr. Joseph F. Pilat is, is a program manager at the Office of National Security and International Studies at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, he's also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, where he co-directs the Nonproliferation Forum. He was the representative of the Secretary of Defense uh, to the Fourth Review Conference of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, or NPT as it's known. He was also a senior advisor to the U.S. delegation at the 1995 NPT Review and Extension Conference, which for those of you familiar with the NPT know that was that was a big event um, in the NPT's history. Uh, he was also the Secretary of Defense representative to the Open Skies negotiations. Um, he's held positions at the Pentagon, the Congressional Research Service. He's taught at a number of institutions. Um, he's authored a number of, of books um, on the subject of arms control and nonproliferation. Um, the most recent of which was, was his being the editor of the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, historical reflections, current challenges, and future prospects. So, for those of you sort of new to the CGSR lecture format, um, the speaker is going to deliver his remarks for about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, at which point we'll open the floor up for discussion. Um, raise your hand electronically uh, and using the WebEx function, submit your questions in the chat. Um, do those as, as soon as you have an idea or you have a question as the speaker is talking, and that will help me get the discussion rolling as soon as he concludes his remarks. And we'll try to get as many of you in as we can in the 90 minutes we have. So, um, Joe, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm, I'm very excited to hear the talk um, and over to you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, my talk will be based on a book manuscript that I just completed with my colleague, Nathan Bush. Um, the views are the authors only, not those of Los Alamos National Laboratory, the National Nuclear Security Agency, or the Department of Energy. The Russian war against Ukraine is closing out its second year. Beyond its devastating consequences for Ukraine, the effects of this protracted war have been far-reaching with a significant impact on the international order. The conflict laid bare weaknesses in the institutions that governed the world since World War II and certainly during the post-Cold War era. The conflict has also revealed limits to various arms control and nonproliferation norms and institutions that have been in place for over 50 years. The conflict has effectively eliminated any prospects for continuing formal U.S. nuclear arms control negotiations for the foreseeable future. There were, of course, already underlying challenges to bilateral U.S.-Russian arms control architecture arising from Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014, Russia's violations of other arms control accords, including the INF and Open Skies treaties, which ultimately led to the U.S. withdrawal from them, and questions about whether New START would be extended, and if so, 
whether a follow-on treaty could be negotiated before or soon after the treaty expires uh, for good in two years. But Russia's announcement in February 2023 that it was, quote, suspending its participation, end quote, in New START raised further questions about whether there was any future to formal arms control. While Russia did state that it would continue to comply with the treaty's limitations on delivery vehicles and deployed warheads, it's unclear how long it will do so and what Russia will do when the treaty expires again in two years. Given the current situations, there are few prospects that either side would be willing to or able to pursue further arms reductions accords in the foreseeable future. The politics in the US, other interests perhaps in Russia. Have we reached the end of formal arms control? Well, there will be no formal negotiations while the war is ongoing. And it's likely that the air will be poisoned for some time after it ends. Beyond the war's impact, problems with Russia's past non-compliance, China's nuclear modernization and refusal to engage in arms control negotiations, and the impact of emerging and disruptive technologies have also darkened the prospects for future formal arms control. Let's look at Russia. Tensions with Russia have been growing for over two decades prior to the invasion of Ukraine. And the bilateral arms control structure had been fraying. Despite a clear U.S. interest dating back to the Obama administration to negotiate a follow on to New START, to deepen cuts and expand arms reductions to include non strategic nuclear weapons, Russia's response was tepid at best and its proposals for a follow-on were, in many respects, non-starters. A new START treaty um, did not look promising. There were questions about whether new START could be extended. It was extended in 2021, but the questions about a follow-on treaty were there even before the invasion. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, along with subsequent suspension of compliance with New START, has effectively killed bilateral arms control for the foreseeable future. It's difficult to see it returning to what it was for a number of reasons. To make matters even more challenging, even if tem tentative steps could eventually make negotiations possible, perhaps after the war is concluded, after tensions have decreased and relations have calmed somewhat, Russia's longstanding track record of non-compliance with previous arms control accords, which they have not been willing to own up to, would likely cast a deep and lasting shadow over any future negotiations. And if any agreement could be reached, would raise fundamental questions about whether that agreement was ratifiable in the U.S. Senate. The Russian problems that uh, I've been discussing may in themselves be sufficient to end formal arms control as we've known it. And, but future progress, if there is any, will be complicated and further challenged by China. China's expansion of its nuclear capabilities would bring it by 2035, according to the latest Pentagon projections, in a rough parity with the deployed nuclear arsenals of both the United States and Russia if they remain at new start levels. As the 2022 nuclear posture review indicates, China's nuclear expansion will need to be factored into, quote, our arms control and risk reduction approaches with Russia, end quote. At the very least, it seems likely that either Russia or the United States It seems unlikely that either Russia or the United States would embrace a treaty constraining their nuclear capabilities while China was not similarly constrained. For the United States, the projected Chinese nuclear buildup has created an unprecedented reality with two nuclear peer adversaries. 
and any U.S. arms control moves would have to consider Chinese forces in some manner. For its part, China has to date been unwilling to consider any arms control negotiations, transparency measures, or nuclear risk reduction efforts, which raises deep questions about future progress in these areas. China has long held it will not engage in formal arms control until the United States and Russia reduce their arsenals to its level, but its nuclear expansion undercuts this justification. And by 2035, it will no longer be possible to argue it, uh, although China may well do so. Other Chinese concerns have been expressed, including their longstanding support for no first use policies, which they claim make other arms control discussions unnecessary, and concerns about potential information revealed by verification activities. These arguments, I would argue, are also effectively mooted by the nuclear expansion in different ways. More fundamentally, the new strategic environment might require rethinking of existing nuclear postures, which could have further implications for the future of arms control. The 2022 NPR continues, quote, we also recognize that as the security environment evolves, it may be necessary to consider nuclear strategy and force adjustments to assure our ability to achieve deterrence and other objectives for the PRC, even as we continue to do so for Russia, end quote. Turning to emerging and disruptive technologies, technology diffusion and growing access of states and non-state actors to sensitive materials and technologies are leading to the rise of latency and possible virtual weapon programs among states, as well as to black marketing and potential nuclear terrorism among non-state actors. Technological advances and the rapid development of artificial intelligence, additive manufacturing, advanced materials, nanotechnology, and other technologies may not directly lead to weapon proliferation itself, but these enabling technologies could exacerbate the problem in the near future by reducing the time, technological difficulties, and costs of proliferation by increasing the efficiency of the processes used for proliferation, and by making the entire project more difficult to detect. This could dramatically reduce the entry barriers to nuclear proliferation and unpredictably worsen historic trends. The impact on arms control would be immense. Moreover, these technologies are not controllable via, via traditional arms control or non-proliferation measures, with a possible exception of hypersonics and UAVs, but we can talk about that further. These technologies raise fundamental questions of deterrence and strategic stability that could challenge the objectives, motivations, and effectiveness of the way in which we've conducted arms control for the past 50 years. For example, uh, cyber and AI threaten nuclear command and control and consequently threaten strategic stability. Hypersonics have the potential to disrupt existing offensive and defensive capabilities, which could create incentives for arms racing and disincentives for arms control. In both cases, these technologies could affect the objectives that we have placed on arms control while being totally outside of the circle that raise fundamental questions about the future value of arms control. For the same reasons that the prospects for formal arms control will be limited for the foreseeable future, most of the informal and non-traditional arms control strategies that have had a real effect during and after the Cold War, including unilateral and reciprocal cuts, moratoria, codes of conduct, confidence building measures will have limited chances of successes for some time. For example, unilateral and unilateral reciprocal reductions cannot be done in the aftermath of the Russian-Ukraine war and China's nuclear expansion. They would send the wrong message to both allies and adversaries. Similarly, confidence and risk uh, reduction measures uh, such as no first use, 
the alerting strategies and so on are not likely for now. And they too could weaken deterrence and security assurances at a time when they are most needed and would not be acceptable to states depending on nuclear guarantees. Other risk reduction possibilities, uh, other confidence building measures might be possible, but uh, these are among the, the ones most highlighted in the international debates around the NPT and in the UN. Similar difficulties hinder attempts to bolter, bolster transparency or improve dialogues. Russia's statements that they could, would no longer be willing to provide information relating to New START, combined with China's longstanding unwillingness to pursue any transparency measures relating to their nuclear program, suggests that efforts to promote transparency will not bear fruit in the near term. Traditional mechanisms for dialogue, including the P5 process, are needed but unlikely to make significant progress for the time being. Given the current tensions among P5 and the unwillingness of Russia and China to engage in productive dialogue, China's recent agreement after the Biden-Xi summit to begin a dialogue with the U.S. is promising but unlikely to yield concrete results in the near term. Despite these challenges, non-traditional and informal arms control nevertheless could play a limited role, and they might be the most promising pathway ahead for the time being. A critical issue and one that will define any possible future steps is how key states, especially the United States, Russia, and China, understand potential mutual interests. As Schelling and Halperin emphasized over 60 years ago, arms control and nonproliferation efforts must build on mutual interests for them to be effective. Although many of the mutual interests that persisted during and after the Cold War appear as germane today as they always have been, Russian and Chinese behavior, even before the invasion, suggests that they may view the matter differently. In this period, before we were in a position to resume any formal arms control, if we resume any formal arms control in any meaningful way, there will be an interesting interest uh, in risk reduction that grows in formal arms control where it fits with mutual interests and where it can be credibly pursued, which is the problem. And there will be increasing attention to strategic strengthening deterrence, missile defenses, and counterproliferation. As long as the war continues, there are limited prospects for action. Even if the war ended now, its impacts will be felt for some time to come. Moreover, an end to the war does not end Russian and Chinese dissatisfaction with the international nuclear order, and their behavior had challenged the nuclear status quo far before the invasion and Chinese demands on Taiwan. Nevertheless, there may be some areas that could be explored, albeit in very limited ways. Um, one that doesn't involve Russia and China, but involves our allies is strengthening extended deterrence. Although extended deterrence has increasingly been criticized in certain circles as destabilizing and counterproductive, it has been a critical component of the international nuclear order, and the non-nuclear weapon states that rely on it have argued for its strengthening. In fact, its central role in both enhancing security and reinforcing non-proliferation goals uh, have, has been demonstrated in the aftermath of the Russian invasion. So far, extensive deterrence has been strengthened by the war not only through NATO's strong and united response to Russia, but by China's more restrained behavior in Northeast Asia, although not in the Taiwan states in the South China Sea, in the aftermath of NATO's response into, to Russia. But we're already seeing erosion, and the situation may look different uh, in terms of the strength of extended deterrence uh, after the war concludes. 
There is a clear need for enhanced efforts at nuclear risk reduction, although the prospects are also affected by geopolitics and not likely to be pursued in meaningful ways for a time being. There's also a need for informal non-treaty efforts to achieve the classical objectives of arms control. As I suggested, some of the informal means, especially unilateral reductions or unilateral reciprocal reductions, are not likely to be pursued in the current environment. The recent U.S. proposal of an, a ban on anti-satellite tests that could result in space debris could be useful and was meant to create a new norm. In similar fashion, there are efforts to build norms in artificial intelligence and other areas that could be productive. Norms can be useful to the extent they reflect mutual interests, but they are limited and ultimately unverifiable. A ban on the testing and deployment of fractional and multi-orbital weapons, which pose a decapitation threat and increase instability, has been proposed and should be considered seriously, I believe. While this may not be achievable in the context of a formal treaty, an informal agreement might be possible. In similar fashion, the importance of ensuring communications during a crisis to prevent miscalculations and misunderstandings that could lead to escalation could be served by proposal to create and regularly exercise dedicated new channels to this effect. Such steps are frustratingly limited and even so are constrained by the current strategic environment. The situation will likely remain unchanged for some time and some of the greatest challenges are likely to come in the future. Not only may the Russian-Ukraine war drag out, but the impact of the war and great power relations will likely last even longer. Moreover, the underlying issues that predate the war will remain. At this stage, it's important to consider what steps we could put in place or build on should the strategic environment change for the better. The P5 process, the P5 process has been maligned uh, in, many area, uh, in many quarters, but it remains the fact that it created something out of nothing and uh, has already had an impact, uh, I think, to some extent on Chinese behavior. Um, the P5 will remain one of the most important venues for dialogue and diplomacy, and I think for socialization on the range of issues in, uh, regarding arms control, verification, strategic stability, and risk reduction, despite the current tensions that have effectively stalemated its operations for the time being. Although there's likely to be limited progress for the foreseeable future, the joint P5 commitment issued in 2022 prior to the 10th NPT review conference and the invasion could provide a starting point for limited cooperation at some stage, especially the P5's joint reaffirmation of support for, support for the non-proliferation treaty, for the importance of avoiding nuclear war, and for the need to prevent accidental and unauthorized use of nuclear weapons. Russia's statements during the war suggest that they may not view this as seriously as they originally uh, did, but uh, nonetheless, it is there. It was a, before a P, it was a P5 statement, it was a Biden-Putin statement. In this context, the Biden administration's recommendations for formalizing a missile launch re notification regime across the P5 is worth exploring. Efforts to address verification challenges that are unresolved today, particularly those relating to warheads and those relating to emerging and disruptive technologies, could be pursued in joint endeavors to provide increased intellectual, scientific, and financial resources, as well as increased transparency. Developing a real joint R&D program to resolve issues surrounding mutually acceptable warhead storage and dismantlement verification could be especially productive now at a time when there's no prospect for disarmament or even further reductions and might 
use this reprieve uh, to make groundwork uh, progress uh, uh, on achieving this capability should the political environment change. Such an R&D program could build on as appropriate the past work that was done or is being done in a variety of forums, including the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, the Quad, and other initiatives. Brazil and Norway are jointly promoting the creation of a group of international scientific experts modeled after the group that opened the path for CTBT negotiations some decades ago. Reviving the creating the environment for nuclear disarmament effort is important, and other potential building blocks to prepare for future reductions should be also pursued when the opportunity arises. The United States and its allies should and undoubtedly will continue to improve deterrence and missile defense capabilities, especially as the st strategic situation continues to evolve. The United States plans to enhance missile defense capabilities to defend the homeland from intercontinental range ballistic missiles, but it's also looking to increase capabilities to defend against an evolving and rapidly changing set of missile threats, including those from cruise missiles, hypersonics, and unmanned aerial vehicles. Enhanced counterproliferation will be important to avoid the impact of further proliferation on strategic stability and the future of arms control. In conclusion, the outcome of the Russia-Ukraine war will be decisive in determining the ultimate lessons learned about the war's impact on the international nuclear order. However, there are already things we can see. The increased salience of nuclear weapons, as well as the potentially long-term negative consequences of the war for arms control, disarmament, and the peaceful uses of nuclear weapons, particularly the threats to Zaporizhia and their potential impact on nuclear energy in the future, um, raise questions about the very foundations of the international nuclear order. It's already clear that the Russian invasion of Ukraine threatens to worsen old nuclear issues and to create new ones, as well as to openly undermine the international order on which the international nuclear order is based. The prospect of preserving the international nuclear order on, uh, does not appear promising at present. If the order collapses owing to long-standing challenges or those posed by the Russian invasion, it could lead to loss of stability, transparency, and predictability in all nuclear matters. There's a worldwide concern about the future of arms control, the prospects of a new arms race, which some believe we've already begun, and the survival of the international nuclear nonproliferation regime. In the case of nuclear forces and force postures, deterrence, nonproliferation, arms control, and disarmament, changes brought by the invasion and other challenges raise the question of whether the old order can be fully restored. It seems unlikely. It will be important to re-examine all elements of the nuclear order that have persisted for over 50 years if it is to be re retained and adopted to the new environment. In that case, all states, and especially the great powers, must return to concepts of mutual interests. The shared interests of the past, as I suggested, were real and did not simply disappear. They can continue to shape the international system in the future if they are recognized and acted on by key states. Let me say one word of postscript. Uh, I did not directly address the challenges to the NPT and the nonproliferation regime. They are as dire as the challenges to formal bilateral and multilateral arms control. Uh, but uh, I only raise them in the con uh, context of their impacts on formal arms control. Thank you.